Hello and welcome to our webcast today where Mike Brucker, Training Manager at RAN3D, will walk us through some of the updates and enhancements to CREO 4.0. So Mike, I will pass things over to you. Thank you, Corrine. So uh, Mike Brucker, coming to you live from uh, very beautiful Chicago today. And what we're going to be taking a look at are just some of the uh, things that are going to look a little different in version 4 of CREO Parametric. Now, if you go in and actually count up all the enhancements, there's uh, several hundred of them. So in our, you know, 30, 40 minute uh, presentation today, we'll hit maybe, you know, 15 or 20 of those. We'll just look at some of the, uh, some of the basic functionality. And then at the end, we'll uh, also talk a little bit more about how you can get some more information about what's new in the form of some uh, different training classes that we'll offer. So with that, we'll go ahead and take a look at some of the uh, basic functions that are either new or going to look a little bit different when you get into uh, version 4 of Creo Parametric. Now, I have a feeling probably a lot of you might be running version 2 of the software now, maybe version 3. So some of the stuff that we'll talk about here might be new in the 3 version, some new in the 4 version. And uh, when we talk about the classes, we do have specific training classes whether you're coming directly from uh, Creo Parametric 2 to 4 or whether you're going to 3 to 4, we have a very specific class that's going to show you exactly what's going to look different in your software. Now, one of the first things we want to look at is just what the general interface is going to look like. We'll notice that the default color scheme is different. They've gone to a darker gray background, although most of you probably changed the color scheme anyway. And, of course, any customizations you had made in the previous versions as far as what the color scheme is going to look like, those customizations are going to carry over into the 4.0. But if you happen to be using the default, the, color, the default color scheme is a little different in uh, Creo 4. We'll also notice that the top of the model tree, we're now going to label what the different tabs are instead of just the icon. In the lower left corner of the screen is a new tool called Full Screen Mode. It's an icon you can hit. You can also hit the F11 key to activate full screen mode. And what that's going to do for you is make the model take up your entire computer screen. You're going to see just the geometry, so the model tree and the ribbon are going to disappear. And what that might be useful for is if you're doing a presentation or you uh, just want to take the whole screen with the model or do a screen capture, just hitting that icon or the F11 key will take you into this new full screen mode. One of the bigger enhancements we're going to see in version 4 here is the introduction of this new mini toolbar. It's a palette of icons that are going to come up when you select something. In this example, we've selected a surface from the model, that green surface, and when we select that, this mini toolbar is going to come up and give us a bunch of different options of what we can do to whatever we've selected. Now, the idea of the mini toolbar is it's just going to make it a little less clicking, less mouse movement. Instead of having to move up to the ribbon and select an icon, there'll be icons directly in that mini toolbar. Now, it does come preloaded with the standard set of icons, the mini toolbar does, but we'll see that you can also customize that. So if there's some command you're running frequently and you'd like to have it in that mini toolbar, it's really just a matter of finding that icon, dragging it over, dropping it somewhere on that toolbar, and then you'll uh, have a very efficient looking interface. Another thing we'll notice, a uh, small enhancement here, when we get into version 4, the display of the coordinate systems is going to look different. So those of you that run other CAD systems, whether it's SOLIDWORKS or Inventor, just about everybody else has, you know, coordinate systems with the arrowheads. So on the right hand, we're looking at what's going to be in Creo 4. Of course, in the old version, we didn't have the arrows on the axis. So that's simply just a little bit different icon when we're looking at coordinate systems in the new version of the software. Also. When you have multiple files open, if you have several windows open, you can uh, go to the icon we see here and change windows. Now, that's not new. That's always been in the software. But you don't necessarily have to use that anymore. So now if you want to switch windows, you can just click in any window, and that window will be fully active so you can do things in it. You don't have to go to that activate command anymore. Or if you like to use your Windows toolbar, you can pick different windows down there. Or if you do the uh, Alt tab, to display different windows. Any of those techniques, as soon as the window is visible, it's going to be fully activated now. You don't have to go to the pull-down menu or use the activate icon. You just bring the window in front so it's visible, and you can immediately start working in that window. That'll save us a couple of clicks. 
Now, what we're looking at here is that new full screen mode. So this is useful if you just want to make the model as big as possible on the screen. So even if your uh, Creo session wasn't maximized, when you go into this uh, full screen mode, it's going to make the model take up the entire screen. And by default, you're going to see just the geometry and the in graphics toolbar. Everything else is hidden. You don't see the model tree anymore. You don't see the message window at the bottom or the ribbon at the top. Now, if you do want to access uh, the other interfaces, like the model tree and the ribbon, you can exit full screen mode. Just hit the icon again, or the F11 key is going to toggle the full screen on and off. But the, if you are in full screen mode, you can still get access to the other interfaces. If you're in full screen mode and you put your cursor over on the left side of the window where the model tree is, the model tree is going to appear just by putting your cursor over there, and you're still in full screen mode. If you move your cursor away from there, the model tree will disappear. If you put your cursor at the top of the window where the ribbon is, the ribbon will appear. So you can bring up the different interfaces that you need to see just by putting your cursor where they are. And then if you want to turn the full screen off, just hit the F11 key, and then you'll be back to your regular mode. So that's just a quick and easy way to make the model take up the entire screen, whether you're doing that to get a screenshot or you're just showing somebody the geometry and you want it as big as possible. All right, now what we're looking at here uh, is a part model. On the left side, we can see the layer tree for that part. And then on the right side, we're looking at the model tree. One thing you've probably noticed in the software is if you went in and hit a layer, all the geometry on that layer would be hidden. However, when you look at the individual features in the model tree, they wouldn't show that they were hidden. So in the older versions of the software, let's say I take a layer that has my three datum planes on it this zero, one, parts, all default datum planes. If I hide that layer, of course, I won't see the three datum planes on the model. But in the older versions of the software, if you looked at the model tree, those three planes would not be grayed out in the model tree. Looking at the model tree, there would be no indication that those were hidden. You had to know that you hit them through the layer functionality. So what they've done in version four of the software is made it so that if you hide something individually or hide it through the layer functionality, either way, those, I, those items are going to be grayed out in the model tree. So now, just by hiding the layer, when I come over and look at my model tree, I can see the three planes that were on that layer are now indicated as hidden. So it's going to be a lot easier to tell that things were hidden, because regardless of how you hide it, whether you pick the plane individually and say hide, or whether you pick the entire layer and say hide, the individual features in the model tree are going to be listed as hidden either way. This makes it easier to see. Now, in a recent version of Creo, we've added a new command that allows you to find something in the model tree, where you could select a feature or a component of an assembly from the geometry. Then you could right-click, and there would be a command that said locate in model tree. And what that would do for you is expand the model tree if necessary. Maybe you selected a component that was down, nested in a couple sub-assemblies. It would expand the tree as many levels as it needed to to display that item. And then it would also scroll the screen up and down on the, on the screen so that that, thing was, that row was right in the middle of the screen. That command to locate in the model tree from the pop-up menu was introduced in one of the early Creo versions, whether it was one or two. What's new for the four version is to turn that on and just make it automatic. If you turn on this automatic locate in tree, then all you have to do is select something from the geometry. And as soon as you click on that item, it's going to expand the tree as many levels as it needs to. It'll scroll the tree up and down on the screen if it needs to, and then show you exactly where that item is. Now, if you want to turn this new option on to have it automatically find things in the tree, you'll go to the Show menu, which is this one here, and then just turn on the Auto Locate in Tree. And that's brand new for this 4.0 version. Now, here's the mini toolbar. This is probably uh, going to be one of the uh, most useful enhancements in 4 because it uh, really eliminates a lot of clicking and a lot of mouse movement. Instead of having to go up to the ribbon or do right clicks to get the pop-up menu, now as soon as you pick something, if I go in and select something with my left mouse button, as soon as I do that, this mini toolbar is going to come up. And what we're looking at here are the default options. Again, this can be customized. So if there's some icon you would like to see on the mini toolbar that's not there right now, there's a way to go in and add additional commands. You'll also notice that uh, what I've selected here is a piece of geometry. Selected a surface. And you'll notice a bunch of icons are in that mini toolbar that at first glance 
probably don't seem appropriate for a surface. You'll notice the uh, upper left icon here is the uh, edit command to bring up the dimensions. That's something you do on a feature, not on a surface. Same thing uh, right next to it is the edit definition command, there's the edit reference command. So when you select a piece of geometry, it also gives you access to the feature that that piece of geometry belongs to. So I've selected a surface that belongs to some extrude feature in my model. So if I were to go in and hit the edit command, it would display all the dimensions for the extrude feature. Or if I go into the edit definition, it would allow me to edit the definition of that. So this new technique really allows you to have access to the individual geometry and the parent feature that that geometry belongs with. So with one click of the left button, I'm able to access all of that information. And like we said, if there's some other icon you'd like to see on that mini toolbar, you can go in and customize those as well. Now, kind of going along with the idea of the uh, mini toolbar interface, the selection filters have changed a little bit. The selection filter controls what you can pick from the model. On the slide here, the left-hand menu is what we had before version four. The right-hand menu is what's new for version four. And one thing we'll notice on the selection filter is the smart filter's been removed. So we don't have that smart option in four anymore. What we have in the new version is a filter called geometry. And if you go to geometry, it's gonna let you pick edges, surfaces, datums, vertices. You can pick any type of geometry. You can also set the filter to uh, features, or you can set it to a specific type of geometry. So if you only wanna pick edges and not surfaces or datums, well, then you can explicitly put the filter on edges and they'll let you pick that type of geometry. Now, the reason we really uh, don't need to pick the entire feature anymore is because when you select a piece of geometry, maybe you pick the axis line of a whole. When you pick that axis line, you are gonna have access to the parent feature. So you'd be able to do things to the entire whole that that axis belongs to. So I think we're gonna find that most of the time we're gonna want our filter on geometry and then we just pick some piece of geometry like a surface, an edge, or a vertice, and that'll give us access to whatever we were trying to do at that point. Now, just like in the older versions of the software, if you find you have your selection filter on the wrong thing, maybe your filter's on edge and you wanna pick a surface. Now, one way to do that is change the filter to surface, but the other way to do that is just leave the filter on edge, and then if you hold the Alt key, as you're holding the Alt key, you can pick anything you want. As you hold the Alt key, it just ignores the filter and lets you pick any type of GM or any type of entity you want from the model at that point. Now here's an example of uh, using the new filter. I have my filter set on geometry and I went in and selected an axis line from my model. The axis line happens to belong to a hole. So when the mini toolbar comes up, we'll notice that we have the icons for doing the edit, the edit definition, the edit reference, but those icons are not really applied to the axis line, they're for the feature the axis line belongs to, in this case, a hole. So I select an axis line, and then if I hit the edit or the edit definition, it's gonna edit or edit the definition of the whole feature. So it's a little more efficient interface. You don't have to do quite as many clicks to get in and make changes to your feature. Now, when I first pick the axis line, that's the only thing that's gonna highlight. But if I take my cursor and put it over the edit or the edit definition, then the feature that that geometry belongs to is gonna highlight. And then of course, when you go to one of those commands, it's gonna edit or edit the definition of that parent feature the geometry belongs to. Another option in that mini toolbar is zoom to select it. If you've selected something like a piece of geometry, in this example, I selected a surface over here. When I go to that zoom selected command, it's that lower left hand icon, it's gonna zoom in so that that feature takes up about half of the screen. So that's just an alternative to using the regular zooms from the mini toolbar. You can go to that zoom to select it. Now, one way to select things is to drag a box around them. And then it's gonna go in and select things inside of the box. Now, of course, it's only gonna select the type of geometry that the filter's on. In this example, I've gone to my selection filter and put it on edges. And now if I drag a box, it's gonna select edges that are inside the box. But in version four, there's two different ways to drag the box. One method is gonna select anything, in this case an edge, that touches the box. So the edge does not need to be completely in the box. If part of the edge is in the box, it's gonna select the entire edge. Then there's another technique that only picks, in this case, edges that are entirely inside of the box. 
it depends on which way you move the mouse. So as you're dragging the box, if you move the mouse towards the left, it's going to drag out the dashed box, and that's going to select things that cross the box. So if any part of the entity is in the box, it selects the entire entity. If you drag the box to the right, then it's only going to select entities that are completely inside of the box. So just by controlling which way you move the mouse as you're dragging the box, that's going to give you those two different options. Now, if you uh, haven't customized the colors, or if you find these useful, in Creo 4, there's three uh, different color schemes you can choose from. There's a default theme, which is a little bit darker gray than the default theme from 3.0. Then there's a light theme, where the background will be a little bit lighter color, and then there's a dark theme. So if you just wanted to quickly change the color scheme, maybe to take a screenshot or put it in your PowerPoint, we have these three different schemes that we can work through. Then we also have some uh, keyboard shortcuts. Now, when you look at these, you're going to think they're very similar to map keys. And I guess in some cases they could be. But uh, with these keyboard shortcuts, it eliminates the need to have to go in and record the map key or make the map key. Also, what we'll notice is some of the standard keyboard shortcuts that were already there that you had in the older versions, well, they're still there, but you can change them if you want to. So we know that just about every computer program, if you want to open something, you can do the control O, and that's in Creo, and it's been there for a while. But now, if for some reason you wanted to change that, you can go in and customize your keyboard shortcut, and I could change that to anything else I want, like uh, a single letter, or I could use the control key, you can use the alt and the shift key as well. Now, one thing uh, that you could uh, get into a situation with here is you could run out of these. So notice in my example here that I've assigned the extrude command to the letter X. So if I want to make an extrude, I don't need to hit an icon, I just hit the letter X on the keyboard, and that's going to start the extrude command. Now, just like a math key, when you're using these keyboard shortcuts, you don't have to hit enter or say go, you just hit the letter X, and it does it. So that means that I can't have any other shortcuts or any other math key that starts with the letter X. If I had a math key that was, uh, let's say, XT, as soon as I hit the letter X, it's going to do that keyboard shortcut and start the extrude. Now, if you try to make one of these new keyboard shortcuts that conflicts with a map key, so if I already had any map keys that started with the letter X, as soon as I try to assign the X key to the extrude command, it's going to tell me that that conflicts with the map key. And it's going to ask me if I want to uh, change all my map keys to now do the extrude instead. If you want to keep your map key, just say no, and then pick some different command from there. Now, all your existing map keys that you have from the previous version, those are going to carry over, and they're going to work even if you had used the letter that's assigned to the default. It'll just remove the default shortcut key, and it'll allow you to execute your map keys. So you can now reassign the uh, shortcut keys that came standard with the software. You can also make your own. Another thing we'll notice that's a little bit different are our depth options when we're building features. This particular example happens to be an extrude where I've drawn a sketch on a plane and I'm going to go in and extrude it. We'll notice that uh, we can now get access to the extrusion on the second side without having to go up to the dashboard. In the previous versions, if you want a part of your extrude on the other side of the sketching plane, you had to go to the Options tab in the dashboard and then go in and use Side 2, which you can still do. But now on the pop-up menu, you'll notice there's a new option here for the other side, or Side 2 as we call that. And then you can set side two to blind or symmetric or two selected. Those options are the same as before. Also, another new command here, probably most useful if you're removing material, is two sides through all. What that does, of course, is it sets both side one and side two to go all the way through. So just a little more efficient interface. You don't necessarily have to go to the options tab in the dashboard if you want to go in and apply the second side to your feature. Another thing that's new, is uh, the ability to use a negative dimension on one side. So if you want part of your feature to uh, start away from the original sketching plane, there's an option to go in and use a negative dimension for that. Actually, this picture shows that for us. So the original sketch was on the datum plane, kind of in the middle of the part there. And if I use, uh, let's say, just to blind up the 50 on both sides, it's going to extrude 50 on both sides. What's new in the version 4 is the ability to make one of those dimensions a negative. So what I did in this example is took the right-hand 50, just double-clicked on it, made it a negative 10, 
And now you can see, even though I'm using both side one and side two, the entire feature is on one side of the original point. So that negative 10 basically has it start 10 units away from the original sketching plane. So negative dimensions are now allowed for uh, dimensions on the extrusion length. Another thing you can do is when you're using the two selected, where you extrude or revolve up to a selected entity, you can now offset away from that. So in this example, going to the right here, I've extruded it up to a datum plane. And I'll kind of highlight the datum plane for you. And in the old version, that was really the only option. The extrude feature would stop right even with that datum plane. What you can do in the uh, 4.0 version is offset away from that. So if you want to go past the plane or stop short of the plane, what you can do is change this icon right here. Instead of two selected, you can change it to an offset or a transform. And what that's going to allow you to do is go past or stop short of the reference you've selected. The difference between the offset and the transform is what direction you measure that distance in. If you use the offset, you're going to measure normal to the reference. And then if you use the transform, the dimension is going to be normal to the extrusion direction, or that would be normal to the sketching plane. So different options to now have it go past or stop short of the reference. Another new option we'll see is when we're thickening a sketch. Now in the older versions, the only option was to apply the material thickness normal to the sketch everywhere, and then use that thickened sketch to go in and build your feature. That's still available, but there's now a new option to trim the sketch or, or cap that geometry, cap the thicken at the adjacent geometry. In my example here, I'm doing a revolve feature where the cross-section sketch is just a line, that angled line. So I'm going to take that angled line, I'm going to revolve it around, and you'll notice that the uh, thickness, I'll try and highlight this corner down here for you, we're going to notice that the thickness is not normal to the line there. What we did is we turned on this capping option, we asked it to go in and cap the uh, thicken with the model geometry, and I capped it with the top of the gray part. The gray there is an extruded cylinder. Now, if I tell it to cap with the side of the cylinder instead of the top of the cylinder, then it's going to look like the right-hand picture. So it's going to stop the thickening up even with the side. So that just makes it a little bit uh, easier to draw your cross-section. You can now cap the thickening with one of the adjacent surfaces. Another option, uh, this is one we've probably been asking for for a long time in the software. I think probably all the other CAD systems have had this ability. But now in Creo, you can define a plane using a mid-plane option. In this example, I wanted a datum plane right in the middle of my part. So to make the plane, I went in and selected the two green surfaces there and used this mid-plane option. And what that's going to do is give me a plane that's exactly halfway between those. So no dimensions required. And of course, if I change the geometry, that plane's going to update so that it's always halfway in between. What we're looking at here is a new option for making a hole where we place it on a point. In the older versions of the software, a hole placed on a point was always normal to the surface that that point was on. And that point had to be on the surface for it to work in the first place. We'll see now that the point doesn't necessarily have to be on the surface, and the angle of the hole no longer has to be normal to the surface at that point. Now, it will be by default. But if you want to change the angle of the hole so that it's not normal to the surface at that point, at the bottom of the dialog box is this new option here for the hole orientation. Then what you could do is pick an axis or something linear to go parallel to or a plane to make your hole normal to, and that's going to go in and change the angle of the hole. Now, in my example, the point that I placed the hole on was right there. And by default, I would get what we see on the left, where the hole would be normal to the surface at that point. I then went in and used this new option for the whole orientation, and I selected this axis line, that's a datum axis that I had in the model, and I asked my hole, the center line of the hole, to be parallel to that axis. And now we can see the hole starts on the point, and then the hole is parallel to the axis. So again, that's just a little bit more efficient interface. Another option that's new for the hole command is this top clearance. So if you have a hole where the opening of it's covered up by some other geometry, you can go to your options panel, just check the box for this top clearance, and as soon as you do that, it's going to cut away the geometry that covers up the opening of the hole. Now, it's somewhat similar to going and using the second side. Actually, in a lot of cases, you could just apply the second side to the hole 
and get it to cut that geometry away. But where this becomes uh, more interesting and probably more useful is if you have a chamfer, or I should say a countersink or a counter bore on the hole, the geometry that it cuts open is going to match the diameter of that counter bore or countersink. And it's really easy to create. All you have to do is check for the top clearance, and then it's going to cut away that overlapping geometry for you. When you're making a sketch, if you happen to be sketching on a plane that's in the middle of the geometry somewhere, and you don't want to have to look through that existing geometry to see your sketching plane, there's a new option in Sketcher to clip the model. It's just an icon that you toggle on and off, and when you turn that on, it's going to cut away all the geometry on one side of your sketching plane. Just gives you a nice clear view of your sketch. And when you're done with that, just hit the icon again, and the rest of the part's going to come back. Or, of course, when you exit out of the sketch, the rest of the part's going to come back for you. In Sketcher, we're going to see that the uh, mini toolbar is available there as well. If you select something, you'll see some of the common icons on that mini toolbar. Also in Sketcher, we'll notice the display of the constraint symbols looks different. Now the constraint symbols have a box around them. That kind of uh, grayish blue box will be around your constraint symbols. The idea of that is just to make them easier to find. Another thing we'll notice new in Sketcher, this is a fairly big one here, is that uh, all the geometry of the model is usable as a reference without having to pick the reference ahead of time. We know in the old versions of the software, if you wanted your sketch to connect to something or snap to it automatically, or it automatically constrained to it, you had to select that geometry that you wanted to snap to as a reference before you drew the geometry. Now, you can still do that, but you don't have to in this new version. As you're sketching something, if you move your cursor close to any geometry that's in the model, you'll see that it's going to automatically connect to that. You don't need to select that geometry as a reference ahead of time. So what I'm doing here is I haven't selected uh, any references. I start to draw a line, and as I get my cursor close to this edge of the model here, as soon as I get close to the edge, it's going to highlight it. It's going to bring up three little boxes, and it's going to allow me to stamp to the edge. Now, I can stamp to the edge uh, without hitting a specific point, or I could also explicitly constrain to the end point of the edge by getting over one of the boxes on the end, or I could explicitly snap to the center point of the edge by getting to the middle. Now, in the old version, if you wanted a midpoint constraint, you had to get your cursor pretty close to the midpoint before it highlighted anything. Sometimes that was a little bit of a guessing game. So now, when I come over the edge, that box is going to appear in the middle, regardless of where my cursor is, and it'll be easier to find that midpoint. And then once I do use that geometry, it's going to add it to my Sketcher reference. So those of you that are familiar with some of the other softwares, like SolidWorks especially, just like there, all the geometry in the model is now going to be available as a stamping reference or a constraining reference without having to pick it as a reference ahead of time. Also, when you're drawing geometry, if you happen to line up with something that's already in your sketch, it's going to show you a dotted line for that alignment. Now, in this example, I've already sketched the angled line. I put that line in my sketch. And now I'm drawing a second line. So you can see when I get the start point of my second line where it lines up vertically with the end point of the first line, you get that little dashed bar. So that's just a tool to make it a little bit easier to line up things. Then we said uh, in Sketcher, your constraint symbols will now have a box around them to make them a little bit easier to uh, find. If you shade your closed loops, they change the color of that. It used to be kind of a yellowish-orange color. Now it's kind of a purple color for that. So those are some of the things that are a little bit different in the sketch. Now, when you get to assemblies, big change you're going to see there is with the simplified representations. So very simply put, the computer is going to pretty much manage these completely for you. The simplified representation is really a fully automated tool now in that it's always using it, and you don't really have to set up anything yourself. When you go to open an assembly with this new automatic simplified representation, it's going to load up the minimum amount of data it needs to to display the geometry. Then as you start doing things to the assembly where you need more information, like the ability to edit and reference the geometry, automatically on the fly, it's going to load in the geometry that's necessary. So it really tries to maintain the least amount of information in the computer that it needs and then brings that other information in as needed. And it does all of that automatically for you. So there's a new simplified rep that's automatic. If you don't change any settings, you're really always working with this automatic simplified rep. 
Now, if you don't like the new method or you want to go back to the old method, there is a way to bring back the old simplified representation tools where you can build them yourself and assign things yourself to the simplified reps. But the idea of this new automatic one is you really don't have to do much. The computer builds it for you, and then it's always using it. So that's called the automatic simplified rep. A couple other things in the assembly that will look a little bit different. If you ever use the merge and the cutout tools to take geometry of two models and connect them together, there's a new interface for that. Also, they renamed it. it used to be called component operations. It's now called Boolean operations. And the dialog box you see on the right is the new interface for making those. One thing that's different about how it works is you can now apply it to more than one model. So for the modified models, in the old version, you were limited to picking one of those. In this version, you can now select several of the modified, model, modified models. If you work with flexible components, on the pop-up menu, you can now get to your uh, varied items. So if you want to change the varied items table or add or remove those, that's now available on the pop-up menu. So just a different interface there. And then one thing that's new in that varied items table is the tab for materials. So now as you're doing your flexible components, different flexible components can have different materials assigned to them. That's something you didn't have in the old version. And speaking of materials, there's a new interface for accessing your materials, new dialog box. And when you go to assign your materials, well, this is what the interface is going to look like, where you can pick a material from your library, and then off to the right side of the screen, it's going to show you all the information for that material. You don't have separate screens for viewing and editing anymore. When you pick a material, all the information is available. So if you wanted to change any of the numbers for that material, you can do it right there. Also, to get to the materials, you can still go to the file menu, look under prepare, model properties like we did before. But now you can right-click on a model from your tree, the name of the model, and on the pop-up menu will be a command that says edit material. And then that will allow you to go in and assign materials for that particular part. And then once you do that, once you have applied materials to the model, those are now listed in the tree. At the top of your model tree, you'll see a listing of all the materials that you've assigned to that model. And then the material that that model is currently using is the one that has that blue arrow by it. If you want the model to use a different material, just right-click on that other material, say Assign, and now the model will be made out of that other material. Of course, the Edit Definition is going to bring up the dialog box where it lists all the numbers for the material, like the density and Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, and allow you to change those. So just a little bit more efficient interface for getting into those materials. All right, so those are just some of the basic uh, functions that we wanted to talk about a little bit. What I'd like to do now is show you those in the actual software. And I think we're doing pretty good on time. So uh, first thing we'll look at, let me go to a uh, part model that I have open here like this one. So one thing we wanted to look at was the uh, new full screen mode. So if you want to make this model take up the entire screen, what I can do is go to the lower left corner and hit this icon for full screen mode. You can also see that it says the F11 key will take you there. And then when I do that, the model takes up the entire screen. I see just the geometry in the in graphics toolbar. If I want to see any of the other toolbars or interfaces like the model tree or the ribbon, I just put my cursor where they'd be located. If I take my cursor and put it over on the left side of the screen here, I can see the model tree appears. Now, if I move the cursor away from there, model tree goes away. Put the cursor at the top of the window, and then the ribbon will appear. And of course, you can pick things from those. Move the cursor away from that, that disappears. Now, to exit out of full screen mode, I can just go hit the F11 key, and that takes us back to there. It takes us back to where you have your regular interface. Let's look at uh, the, uh, the display of hidden objects now. I'm going to turn on my uh, plane display, and you can see I have a lot of datum planes in my model. Maybe I want to take a layer that has a bunch of those datum planes on it and hide the layer. You'll notice in my model tree right now I have nothing listed as hidden. I'm going to bring up my layer tree, and I happen to have a layer that has all my datum planes on it. It's that top layer there. Every datum in the model is on that layer. I'm going to take that layer, right-click on it, hide it, nothing new for this command, and then all the datum planes that were on that layer have been hidden. Now, what would have not happened in the older versions is when I switch back to the model tree, nothing would be listed as hidden. 
in the older versions, if you hid something through a layer, it didn't really show you that you did that in the model tree. But in version four here, when I switch back to the model tree, you can now see that each one of those datum planes is grayed out. So I now have an indication that I've hidden those. So there's not really any difference as to uh, how you go about hiding and unhiding. It's just the display in the model tree is going to reflect that those things are hidden. Of course, if I go back to the layer and show it again so that they're visible, when I switch back to the model tree, all those items are going to be listed as now visible inside of the model tree. The other thing we wanted to look at was the change to the selection filter. In the old version, we had the smart filter, and that was the one that was on by default. What we'll notice here in version four is when I go to my selection filters, I don't have smart anymore. I have geometry. Now that would allow you to pick any type of geometry, whether it's an edge, a surface, a curve, a quilt, a datum, or I can put it on a specific type of geometry. If I only want to pick edges, I could set it to that. And then you could also set it to features. And that would go in and pick an entire feature for you. So we want to look at what happens when I pick a piece of geometry. And this is different than what happened in the other versions. I'm going to go in and select this surface. It happens to be a surface of a whole feature. And now when I select that surface, we'll notice the mini toolbar comes up, and it gives me access to the apparent geometry as well. So even though I didn't select the whole feature, I selected a surface that belongs to it, I have the ability to go in and do things to the whole feature. Like the edit command, of course that's the one that brings up all the dimensions for the feature. If I hit the edit, that brings up all the dimensions for the whole. If I go into the edit definition, that would bring up the interface that created the whole originally. So it's a little bit more efficient. We don't have to do the right click and pick things off the pop-up anymore. If I want to do anything to that hole, all I have to do is pick any piece of geometry that belongs to the hole, whether it's that surface or that edge even. And then in this toolbar, I have full access to the entire parent feature as well. So just a little bit different interface there. If you do want to pick the entire feature initially, then you can go down to that selection filter and you can set it on features. When you're using the box to select things where you drag a box around, it now makes a difference whether you drag the box towards the right, which picks things that uh, are completely inside the box, or whether you drag it to the left, which will pick things that cross the box as well. To look at that, I'm going to go to my selection filter, put it on edges, close my little help window, and then in this corner, I'm going to drag a box from the left towards the right, like around those three edges. And what I'll notice is it didn't select any of them. Because in that box, none of those edges were completely in the box. However, if I drag the same size box but drag it to the left, that's going to select things that cross the box. So first of all, we'll notice we get kind of a dashed box here. I drag it to the left. And now any edge that had any part of it inside of there gets selected for us. So it makes a difference whether you drag to the left or the right. And again, a lot of the other CAD systems work that way as well. So a new box for that. Another thing we can do is pick a piece of geometry. And in that new mini toolbar is a zoom to select it. If I want to zoom in on that edge that I just selected, that's what this icon will do right there. And then it makes that edge take up a good portion of the screen when you do the uh, zoom to select it. Now, similar to your map keys, there's a new function where you can assign keyboard shortcuts, where you don't have to record the map key to do it. Maybe I go in and I build a lot of uh, chamfer features or round features, and I'd like to just be able to hit a single key on the keyboard to start that. To so go in and configure these new keyboard shortcuts and see which ones you have, you'd go under your file menu, look under options, and there's a new category here for our keyboard shortcuts. And that'll bring up a list of the keyboard shortcuts that we currently have. And if I search on a command, let's look for the round command here. So at the top, I'm going to search for it. And we'll notice that for the round feature, that's been assigned to the letter R. Now, that happens to be the out-of-box default if you haven't changed it, or if you don't already have a map key that starts with the letter R. So I could certainly leave it that way, but if I wanted uh, to do something, uh, have a different command in there, maybe I want to do the control R, because I do have a map key that starts with R. So if I go in and do my control and my R, it's going to come back and tell me that that one's already assigned. So you don't really have to worry about overwriting something you've already created. If there's a keyboard shortcut that's already in use, or if it conflicts with the map key, it's going to go in and tell you this. And then it gives me the option. 
So if I don't like to do the repaint with the control R, if I'd rather do the round with the control R, I can say yes, and now that's been assigned. So just uh, very similar to the math key, just a little bit easier to create those. And the other thing you can do here is you can change the standard one. So we know that in just about any program to open something, you can do the control O, and that's there by default, but if you want to change that, maybe just to the letter O or something else, you could type in something different for that. So maybe we will assign that just to an O instead of the control O. So now if I want to open a file, I don't have to hit the control key anymore. If I just go to the keyboard, hit the letter O, it takes me right into the open command. Now, you'll have to take my word for it that I just hit the O and didn't do a control. So keyboard shortcuts, just uh, similar to the math key, but you don't have to go in and record the math key to do those. All right, so in this model, let's, uh, let's take a look at those new options for the whole. On that cylinder I have at the top of the part, I've created a point there. And I want to make uh, a hole that's centered on that point. So just like in all the versions, I can go to the hole command, I can select that point as my reference, and initially I get a hole centered right on the point, and the axis of the hole is normal to the surface the point was on right at that point. That's the default, and that's what I see here. However, there's a new option in version 4 where I don't necessarily need to have the axis line normal to the surface. Maybe I want the axis line to go parallel to some edge of the model instead. To take advantage of that new option, I'd go under the shape, or under the placement actually, click in this box for the whole orientation, and I could select a different piece of geometry. So maybe I go in and select that edge. Now you can see the axis of the hole is parallel to that edge. Now, probably not a good idea to reference the edge of a chamfer. So instead of that edge, maybe I decide to select this surface as the orientation reference. And now what I'm getting is a hole where the axis of it is perpendicular to that surface. And the hole is still centered on the point. So just a new option for going in and making a, a hole that's on a point. So look at a couple other things here. I think we're still doing fairly good on time. Let me bring up uh, this part. Oh, so a new option that uh, was kind of overdue is the ability to make a plane halfway between two things. So if I want a plane that's, let's say, halfway between that surface and this edge over here, to build the plane like that, I can go to my data and plane icon. I think I'll pick this surface as the first reference. And just like before, it wants to build the plane offset away from it. What's new in the uh, version 4 is the ability to change that to a mid-plane and then pick a second reference. Now, just like before, when I pick the second reference, I need to hold the control key, and I'm going to pick this edge. And now I have a plane that's halfway between those two, parallel to the surface that I selected. So no dimensions involved, and of course, if I change the geometry, that plane's going to update to always stay halfway between those. And while we're here, let me hide the planes that I don't need to see using my new mini toolbar. All right, then uh, just maybe one more thing to look at were some of those new uh, commands and menus for the depth options. Let's go ahead and make an extrude. And also, I want to start the extrude using my new mini toolbar. I want to make an extrude where I put the sketch on the data plan I just created. So what I'm going to do, I'm not going to hit the extrude icon. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick the data plane first, and now in my mini toolbar, I can see I have the extrude command. And what that's going to do is make an extrude where the sketch is on the plane that I just selected. So as soon as I hit the extrude command or the letter X from the keyboard, it's going to immediately take me into my sketch. Now in the sketch, there's an edge running horizontally right about here. I'd like to see it. Now to be able to see the edge, there's a couple things I could do. I could go to my uh, display options and turn on hidden line mode. That's the edge I'm talking about. Or there is a way to see it without doing that. So maybe we'll go back to our shaded mode. Maybe I'll spin to a 3D view. There's an option here now to cut the model in half. So when you're in a sketch, if you're sketching plane somewhere in the geometry, you can hit this new icon to clip the model, and then you can see it cuts away all the geometry on one side of your sketching plane. Might make it a little bit easier to see what you're working on. Now I'm going to go back to the 2D view of my sketch plane. And another thing we'll notice is all of the geometry of the model is now a live reference. So if you go to sketch something and you get close to an edge or a surface or a vertice, you're going to see that it snaps to that geometry even when it's not a reference. I'm going to make a rectangle, and when I get close to this edge, you're going to notice that it highlights the edge. It's not a reference, but it highlights it, and brings up three little boxes. So you can specifically snap to those three points 
or in general, you can snap to the edge. Maybe I want my rectangle to start at the midpoint of that edge or the midpoint of that surface. So I could come over the box in the middle and start my re rectangle there. And now I have a sketch that looks like that. Now, if you do let it just automatically connect to some geometry, after you do that, if you come back and look at your list of sketch or references, that geometry that you snapped to will be there. So if you prefer to pick your references ahead of time like we did previously, you can still do that, but you don't really have to anymore because all the geometry of the model is going to be available as a reference. And if I want to bring back the rest of the part, I can just turn off my clipping, and then I see the rest of the model. Let's go ahead and finish the sketch. And we can see it starts by extruding on just one side of the sketching plane. If I want part of the extrude on the other side of the sketching plane, I don't have to go to that Options tab anymore. If I right-click on the drag handle for the depth, you can see that the other side is now on the pop-up menu. So if I want to extrude it to the left, I could ask maybe for a blind depth going to the left. Now I have drag handles for an asymmetric depth here where I can just drag those out. I could also right click, there's a new option called two sides through all, probably more appropriate if we're cutting material away, but it'll go all the way through the part on both sides of the sketching plane. Let's undo that one. Uh, another thing that's new here is the ability to change one of those dimensions to a negative value. So if I want all of this on the right hand side of my sketching plane, I'm gonna take this to 167 dimension, I'm gonna make it a negative 30. And now what we'll notice is the entire feature, even though I'm using both sides with two dimensions, the entire feature winds up on the right side of that original plane. And then another thing that's new, let's right click on our depth handle here for the first side, set it to two selected, and we're gonna extrude up to that surface on the outside of the part. Now that's not new, you could always do that. What's new is the ability to go past that surface or stop short of that surface. If you want to do that, you can go under your Options tab here, and instead of stopping right at the surface, I can change this icon. So I can make it an offset or a transform. The difference between those two is what direction it takes the dimension in. If I change that to the offset here, now I can take the offset and just drag the dimension out. Now that dimension, this 133, I'll change it to 100, that 100 dimension is perpendicular to the green surface. Now, if you want the dimension to go in the extrusion direction instead, or be normal to the sketching plane instead, that's what the other option does. So instead of an offset, you can change it to this transform or translation. And now the dimension, the 100 dimension, is now normal to the sketching plane instead of that green reference. So that's just a new option for controlling the depth of a feature. All right, so uh, as promised, we hit on about, you know, 1% of the enhancements there. I think this is probably where we'll stop. But uh, the idea was just to get you a little bit excited about what's new in Creo 4. I think you'll really find the interface is a lot more efficient. If you count up how many clicks it takes to make a feature, it's probably 20 or 30% less in this new version. Even more if you go in and customize those menus, like the mini toolbar, 